Well, we come this morning to consider the baptism of the Lord Jesus. And um, we come, therefore, now to the 21st verse. And it says here, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And then there is a note, and Jesus himself began to be about this of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. And then comes uh, the genealogy, which traces, uh, the genealogy traces Jesus right back to Adam, and it ends up then, and Adam, who was the son of God. There's a particular reason for Jesus doing that, because we must always remember in the back of our mind, always to keep it there, that this was something written personally to Theophilus. It was written to him personally. And he was a Gentile. And Luke, if I could put it like this, he tailored these things in such a way meticulously as he was so meticulous with everything else that he wrote, both in the his Gospel and in Acts, tailoring them particularly to confirm to uh, Theophilus all that he had been taught. And he was a believer. And so this is the way that Jesus is taking up now these things to confirm to him the things that he most surely believed. And the purpose of Luke writing to this was this, to really ground him in the truth. And we come to this place now where there is the recording of his baptism in water, in the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, coming down upon him in bodily form. Uh, we could note here that this would have been, in one sense, if I say a private baptism, it was in Jordan. Everyone else that was coming for baptism at that time had, had been baptized. And they would have gone away. And then Jesus comes to John the Baptist. We know that from other accounts from, uh, of, the, of, of, of this baptism, that John the Baptist was very conscious of his unworthiness and he needed to be baptized with Jesus. Now, Luke doesn't record those things. He wants to record the things that he regards as being essential to Theophilus. And he speaks like this and says that after he had been baptized, it, he, he speaks of, of uh, praying, being baptized and praying. Praying, the heaven was opened. Jesus had been baptized. He was praying. And in his praying, heaven was opened. And then there was a sign. It was both special and purposeful to John and to, uh, to, to John in particular because John had been told that he would know the Messiah by 
the coming upon him of the Holy Spirit. And here was the Holy Spirit taking on bodily form. It wasn't necessarily the form of a dove. We're not told exactly what shape and form it was. We are told about the descent. It was as a dove. And in this word that speaks of descent, it's compounded with the preposition, the preposition peri. And it means that as a dove comes down and takes a, a circle to see and then come upon a particular spot. This is the picture of the descending of this, the Holy Spirit in bodily form. And it's, 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 it is as a dove, as a dove would land. And we can see there would be some sense of prolongedness of this. Not a long time, but to really confirm in John the Baptist's heart and mind and spirit all that had been, he'd been told what to look for so that he should know who to look for. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then there was a voice from heaven. Heaven's in the singular. From heaven. That particular dwelling place, the eternal abode which Jesus had left, that heaven, the place of the eternal abiding of the Father. That place which Jesus had been eternally abiding in. And the voice came. A voice. The voice of his Father to speak. This thou art my beloved son, addressed particularly to the Lord Jesus. If you read this in the order that it is, thou art, thou art my son, the beloved, or the beloved one. And this was a word of assurance, yes, in thee am I well, please, it's translated here in the present tense. It's actually in the past tense. And, uh, and it's in an aorist form. In whom I was pleased. And in Luke's Gospel, there are two things together that would be showing us things that pleased his father. The first would have been that we considered when I was here, was it no, um, when I was here um, um, some time ago, I considered when he went up and was taken up and went up in obedience to his bar mitzvah. And he was found in the house of his father, about his father's affairs, about his father's business. And we are told that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Not, not that he grew in favor to earn, as it were, brownie points to earn some sort of a credit account with his father. He grew in grace and in favor with God and man. And the father, you can imagine it, the father 
would have been pleased. And so far as it was, he was, so far as we considered Jesus, the word made flesh, that young boy who was a boy going into the temple and who was a man coming out of the temple on that day to grow and mature in stature into the fullness of all that he would be capable of growing into so that the purpose of him being sent might be, 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 be fully realized and completed. Here was this young man in the very stages of the beginnings of manhood coming, coming, coming. And that would have brought pleasure to his father. And then there was this very act. The Lord Jesus completely identifying himself. If it was in our brief this morning, if I could use that word to take all the other things into account concerning this, of him coming and bringing a completeness of pleasure to the Father. And then, um, do you know, as I was thinking over this, I was going back to the very first days that I can remember. I left school at 14, didn't know much about grammar at all. I won't go into the uh, idiosyncrasies now about that journey, but I do remember that when you start a sentence, you start with 66 and 99. That's the first way it was put down. Of course, they were teaching us about inverted commas. And we have that beginning of Jesus, the very beginning of his manhood. And then when we come here, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's this, 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 and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Um, Luke has his peculiar, particular, personal way of writing things down and stating things. And it is as if as this is the, 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 uh, I, I wonder if I could use the illustration of the 99 of inverted commas. He's, he's at 30 years of age. In that which speaks of his maturity as a man. He's going to continue for 33 years to bring and give pleasure to his father in all that he is destined to do. And the father was pleased. We can say that the father is continually pleased. But that word suggests something to bracket in, as it were, to put in. That word is there. And beloved, oh, this gives us a confidence. It gives us a confidence. It would have given Theophilus a confidence. It gives us a confidence to see how Jesus was walking step by step. There are the hidden years. Nothing is recorded about it. And therefore, in one sense, it's absolutely useless to speculate about anything. Because all the speculation for whatever is only the thoughts of men. Because we are told nothing that brings revelation. Nothing, absolutely nothing. If we were needed to know about it, God in his eternal, infinite wisdom would have revealed it to us if it was necessary for us to know it. 
and he hasn't revealed it. And the safest thing we can all do is leave it. In one sense, not to be bothered about it. So that our attention is given unto all that is necessary and all that is absolutely necessary for our good, for our maturing, for our growing up, so that we might please the Father. That we might please the Father. We can't say please the Father as Jesus pleased the Father, but that as he pleased the Father, fulfilling all that was in his Father's will and purpose concerning him, the greatest thing that we can ever do for the praise of God's eternal glory is to walk in his ways and to please him for all that he would have for us to do. That's at least part of an application this morning to us to walk in ways and in a way that pleases him. And then Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, eh? I find the simplest way to express this with meaning is this, that he's under being the full control of the Holy Spirit. He's not relying on anything of his own will. And we must think of him here as in his 100% humanity, not relying on any, he has his own will, not relying on that, perfect though it is. He's led of the Spirit into the wilderness and into the wilderness. And it's not just his leading into the wilderness, it's his leading are in the wilderness, through the wilderness, and out of the wilderness. And he wasn't even relying on his own strength in the temptation. He was there, relying, being led of the Holy Spirit. And of course, when we come to think of this, we've got to think of two things. I know the classical way of putting it is this, is that in his human nature, was it impossible for him to sin or possible for him not to sin? I was surprised I was reading. I, I, I just happened to look at something that happened to be a father, a father and uh, he would be noted as one of the great scholars, and he said that uh, in this matter, we, we, we should leave it all behind. And we can't. Because you see, when Jesus was tempted, he was tempted in exactly the same way as Adam was tempted. And if you would ask, what, what, what was Jesus like in his humanity, or what was his humanity like within him, or what he possessed, or what was his? You've got to take it back to, to Adam. Before Adam sinned, he was exactly the same as Adam before Adam sinned. Exactly the same. Otherwise, if he wasn't, who would be the first to call for a level playing and shout foul? the devil himself. It's not fair. And you see, when he fights this battle, he's fighting this battle on a level playing field so that all that was lost on the level playing field might be regained completely. 
That was the purpose of temptation. And the devil only left him for a season. And if I might say it, for a convenient season. Because as soon as a convenient season arises, he's the first one to take advantage of it because he sees it so for his own purpose and his own purpose alone. If it's not for his own purpose and his own purpose alone, he doesn't take it. Because he wants to gain an advantage over us as he sought to gain an advantage over Jesus. And that's the way he works. And all these things that are here are recorded to fortify us. Oh, pardon me, harping on about Theophilus. You know, I just can't get away from it. I tell you why, I tell you why. Because years and years and years and years one has had one's mind, the fame set, there's a fame of one's mind has been looking at, oh, looking at this as, as one of the synoptic gospels. There's a sense it isn't synoptic. It's absolutely unique on its own. And I believe it should be kept on its own in that sense as, as John's gospel is on its own. Of course, there are cross-references. And we can use cross-references to our advantage. But it's a terrible thing to be taught all about the cross-references and find out that, it, uh, that, to me anyway, personally, it's been a disadvantage. Only this last few. Oh, I can't even speak of it as years. Coming to see it. At least, I trust it is a comfort to you, beloved. It's a comfort to me to know that it was written to someone personally and that out of that personal application of Luke, there's a personal application to us, individually, personally. And then, where it can be applied, oh, and I fully believe in this, where it can be applied corporately, Not that the only gospel of Luke is the only one that we ever have, or we have, where it can be applied corporately. Oh, we receive it. I've got to preach that with all my heart, or teach it with all my heart, or desire to do it with all my heart, so that we receive the benefit of it. Because he just does not come, the evil one just does not come to attack us personally on these things. He comes to attack us in such a way that he might bring the corporate company, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, in the local assembly to, to bring us down and to get us off the beaten track. It is a beaten track. Others have gone before and we are called earnestly to contend for the faith that was given once and for all. It is a beaten track. Blessed be God, he enables us to see those who pioneered the track in the first place and know of others and learn from others who have pioneered, pioneered the track in what is recorded for us historically, and then those who we know. Oh, and I thank God for them. Sought to nurture us, some sought to nurture us before we became Christians. Some of those nurture was able to nurture us after we became Christians. Then there were those who the Lord brought to nurture us. They might have been the very people who were involved in the decision that we would have made. At least I made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We all have, in one way or another, our own personal way, wherein we have been brought 
face to face with the Lord Jesus and said, yes, I will follow you. And beloved, there are those who have nurtured us. They've gone before. I can only speak of one in that sense in this fellowship. Dear brother, pastor, leader, pioneer. Yes, pioneer. Brian Phelps. Led of God to lay the foundation in this place. So that you together here might stand firm upon it unflinchingly to serve the Lord all and until the end of your days. And if we go before he returns, that others may be continuing to go on that beaten track faithfully serving him in that unflinching, uncompromising way that has been laid down and being full of the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit. He returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. I'm just wondering, believing, beloved, that perhaps that is the right place to stop this morning. And God willing, be able to uh, pick it up again from there, as it were, and uh, in my way of saying it, uh, run with it. And so, beloved, I trust that there has been something this morning that has, that has confirmed us in the way thus far. Was it in Deuteronomy? Thou shalt remember all the way the Lord thy God has led thee. Thou shalt remember all the way the Lord thy God has led thee. And in writing those words of Moses, thou shalt remember all the way the Lord thy God has led thee. He was writing that so that it would be personal to everyone so that in their wanderings, in that place where it is written, they might continue. So that after his days, across that Jordan, via a conquered Jericho, on to the place that God had for them. I must stop now because all of this is just something added on the end, and even that would take away the essential. Amen.